Hello, my friends. I'm Marietta, and I welcome you to Marietta's Art Channel. To reduce anxiety and stress with art has been my life's greatest blessing. We all have a personal and unique way to cope with anxiety and stress. Creating art is my therapy. This is my story. art. But today I thought I would talk to you a little bit about a YouTube video that I made with Dom Victor and his podcast Drawn to Win. It's regarding art and how it reduces stress and tension and anxiety. And nowadays that's so important. So I hope you enjoy it. I hope you can relate to some of it. And I would love to hear your comments. I so appreciate you and all the things that you've said that are kind and wonderful in acknowledging me. Take care. This is my personal story. How the love of art gave me a purpose. How it made my heart sing when my soul was aching. How it helped me escape the world even for a brief moment. It still fills that void. And please stay safe. Welcome to this beautiful conversation today. Energy, 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 and excellence. Energy and excellence, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And so, Miss Marietta, welcome into the conversation. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And as you guys can already hear, this woman has incredible amounts of energy. And so, I'm going, I'm going to enjoy this conversation. Um, so, Miss Marietta, where, where are you from? Well, that's a loaded question. I uh, <laughs> was born, <laughs> I was born in Poland, and in Kraków, Poland, which is the southern part of uh, Poland, and came to the United States when I was 10, mm -hmm. didn't speak any English, and went through a lot. It was a major change in my life that shaped me the way I am. What part of Poland are you from? You said in the south? Yes, it's uh, it's Krakow, you Krakow. know, in English. And it's one of those um, beautiful cities that hasn't been destroyed in the war. Mm. So the arts and the history and everything is still intact there. There was a stigma when I came here against Polish people. And mm -hmm. I went through so much bullying and unbelievable things that made me sad and upset. And all along I was in a foreign country and had to learn how to speak in English and deal with unbelievable things. I think I need to go back a little bit to the virus. Are you holding um, up it over does there? Have yeah, it does have a lot to do with how I was brought up and what happened to mm. me in Poland and what's happening right now. It sounds kind of strange, but it all started with the toilet paper story. We discussed toilet paper, how people raided the toilet papers in Costco and stores and there was none to be found. And I just had a flashback when this happened and I thought it was kind of I don't know, strange, but I felt I was back in Poland because when I was wow. being raised in Poland, there was no toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And when there was toilet paper, people would stand in line at four o'clock in the morning. And this toilet paper wasn't beautiful like this toilet paper, nice and soft and everything. People would stand and then they would get this roll of toilet paper carry around their neck and walk around the street with toilet paper. Wow. And and I thought, oh my God, this is so surreal. I am I feel like I'm back in a communist country. Yeah. And then government started closing things and schools and necessary areas 
that you know, didn't permit people to be close, which I totally agree with. I went through almost like a PTSD situation. I just started wow, crying. Wow. I actually had a couple of people call me and I just broke down and I said, I feel like I'm back in Poland right now. And I couldn't explain it. And I was so devastated with how I was feeling. I thought, this is ridiculous. I shouldn't be feeling like this. This is a free country. We're doing the right things to prevent the virus from spreading and everything else. And so I called my parents and they're still alive in Eugene. And I asked them if they felt anything like that. And my mother's deaf, she can't talk on the phone, but my father said, nope. She goes, I went through so much in the war and so much trauma and everything that, no, I, I don't feel that. Hmm. And I'm like, wow, I still had that in me. And I had no idea I felt that there's uncertainty and you wear your private face and your public face and you don't show your private face out in public. And if you say anything as a child that could be taken something to do with your parents did something wrong, they could be killed. Hmm. My father would tell me stories about people walking on the street and KGB agent would come and get them with the poison umbrella. But what's a poison umbrella? Stab the person with it. Whoa. Yeah, and that was real. And I went to first and second grade in Poland, and we started school when we were seven, not six. So I went kindergarten and then two grades. And on the jackets, we would wear a number. Schools didn't have names, they had numbers. Hmm. So I still have those insignias. And basically, if you did something wrong as a child, you would be reported to the school. There's so much of that in me, I guess, still, and everything that's happened to me, I have a fear of talking about it sometimes. And when I do, I felt feel this knot in my stomach, like something is gonna happen. And yeah. it doesn't make any sense, so. No, I don't know if it doesn't make any sense. It kind of makes sense to me. If, if, you, if you were in a house, you know, where let's say your father beat you and screamed at you all the time, and sometime in the future, you know, like you always see those things, you know, guy moves his hand quickly and then you flinch. And so it happens at this primal core level. It's not a, a, a cerebral reaction, right? There are many times like in my life where I thought I was over something decades later. And then you're put into a situation and all of a sudden you're like, Vroom! you're back in there and your body reacts and you're like, what the heck, you know? You get feelings or, you know, just, just emotions come up. Obviously, the difference is that now being much more conscious and aware and an adult, you, you can take control over those things where when you're a child, stuff happens to you all the time. And, right, exactly. Um, but the feelings are still there and the eeriness of the similarity is still there. I know everything going on right now is for the good of everyone and it's the right thing. But going back to the toilet paper story, when I finally met my father again, he defected when I was six. And so I was raised in Poland with a nuclear family. My grandparents, my mother's parents, lived with us in a 16th century building in the third story and history everywhere. But I felt loved and wanted by my family and no father. My sister was just born when that happened and we're six years apart. That's another story, she passed away. When I came here when I was 10, we drove across the country and I had my first hot dog and my, saw my first moccasins and ketchup and all kinds of things. And I woke up in Eugene in the same house my parents still live, believe it or not. And I went to the bathroom and I saw this beautiful toilet paper with flowers on it. No more flowers now, but <laughs> there were blue flowers and pink flowers. And I thought, oh my gosh, my father made a special trip somewhere. He found this incredible toilet paper. It was soft. You could cut it in perfect squares. So every time I go to the bathroom, I would sit there and I would tear the paper and I would pile it up in the squares and I put it in a bag and I hid it in my in my bedroom and thinking I'll never see that again and after a while it kept appearing again and again and I just realized oh my god this is normal here in the United States this is unbelievable and 
then I finally told my parents, and my mother was laughing. He goes, I wonder what happened to all that toilet paper. <laughs> it was such an embarrassing thing. Everything else in Poland, but we didn't have those yeah. things. But that's what you live with, and you don't know any different. So yep. you make happiness a different way. So going back to art, Poland, even in first and second grade, we had art classes. We had so much art around us, and my mother was an amazing artist growing up and in school we had this memory book that we passed around classmate and teachers and they would write in it and they would also do a drawing mm -hmm. and everybody had one of those memory books and every year you would have everybody sign it and i still have it and i look at it and go wow art was so important in everybody's life i remember i i asked my mother to do something in there Mm -hmm. And at that time, we didn't have any kind of paints or anything in the house. Mm -hmm. So she used chalk and toothpaste to this amazing painting on my page. Really? Yes, it is amazing. Yeah, and there are strawberries with flowers, strawberry flowers. And I thought, that is just the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. My grandfather, who lived with us in Poland, he was an art historian and a poet. It's actually famous wow. and he spent countless hours as I was growing up showing me works of the masters it's beautiful art books and I still have those it's my memory of my grandfather and the appreciation for art he gave me growing up they're different styles and as a little child I would just copy try to copy the masters we didn't have much in Poland, but we had pencils and pens and just anything we could get hold of. And, you know, I remember going to these churches and those were amazing works of art. You really felt God there. The world is full of beauty and art and the parks and everything. So really my memories of, of Poland aren't all the scary, mm -hmm. don't talk to people. It was also probably my most happy moments as well and just being free to have art in my life. Was Thank that you. your, your, your mom's dad? Yes, and when we came here, they followed us. When my father defected, we tried to get out for four years. We couldn't get out. My both parents are biologists, and hmm. they're famous in their field as well. They're the first people to ever film cell division in the world. What? Yes. Really? What they used is hemanthus. It's a blood lily, and it's from Africa. And mm -hmm. the reason they use that to study cell division is because it has the one of the largest chromosomes. Cell division is all about how the chromosomes divide. And so they would use electron microscopy and all kinds of different chemicals to see how it caused the division to change and mutate, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they filmed it for the first time in the world. It was shown at the World Fair at the time. And I can't wow. tell you the year. When my father defected, he was in Sweden. He was lecturing abroad. He was very much in demand. And he was approached by a KGB agent wanting him to spy for the Polish government. My father didn't do well with that. He was very anti-communist and he reacted a certain way, which made it impossible for him to come back mm. to Poland. So that's so, why he defected? Well, he asked for asylum in Sweden and he was granted that. And he lived there for a year, and then he was uh, asked for his asylum in the United States. He was given all kinds of opportunities to go anywhere he wanted. Hmm. But he chose Oregon. He loved nature and the outdoors. He was a mountain climber. He chose the University of Oregon. So then we tried to get out. I remember he would write letters to my mother, and she would open them, and they would be totally blacked out. You couldn't read anything. They went through every letter he wrote. I am a proud American. I am so grateful to be here. I became a citizen when I was 13. When you had to get a visa and a passport to be able to come here. And in three days, I had to say goodbye to all my friends, my teachers, everyone I knew, and I'd never see them again. Then we flew into, into New York, into the Kennedy Airport, and I remember walking out I mean, this was a huge plane, and we actually walked outside onto the tarmac. 
and there were people up above on a balcony waving and the sun was setting and my mother said there's your father there's your father and I looked up and I go wow I don't know him that's when we drove across the United States all the way to Eugene wow and so yeah so, yeah it was it was it was pretty amazing wow one other thing that is really an amazing thing of becoming an American was mm -hmm. when the ceremony happened where you got sworn in as an American United States citizen there were there were a whole bunch of people in the room hundreds maybe two three hundred mm -hmm. and the judge was on this platform and he he uh, uh, looked around and he said I'm going to pick somebody to say the Pledge of Allegiance with me and he picked me little girl what? yes and I wore this dress mm -hmm. and it was dark blue with a red and white little neck thing mm -hmm. and it was the most amazing moment of my life since then the dress was maybe a little bit too big and every time I would take a test in school I would wear that dress <laughs> just for good luck <laughs> That's awesome. That's yeah. So cool. Man, that's a beautiful story. <laughs> I am so grateful every moment. And I really try not to take anything for granted. And my freedom to express myself, do my art, the freedom of the word. There are certain things I will say because I know I'm free to do so, but I still have this angst in me a little bit. Mm. You shouldn't be saying that in public kind of thing. We are so lucky in every way. That's where I'm coming from. When I came here, I didn't speak in English. My parents spoke, but bro broken English, they still speak broken English. I skipped third grade because they wanted me to be with kids of the same age as myself. And kids were very curious about me. They all wanted to know about me. And I only took math because I couldn't do any English classes or anything. So every day I would come home and my mother would teach me 10 new words every single day, quiz me on it. And that's how I learned English through her. After a little while, curiosity wore off and that's when the bullying started. The Pollock jokes were rampant then and mm -hmm. um, they've never seen a foreign person in Eugene, Oregon. During recess, they would kick me, spit at me, molest me basically. And I would come home and cry every single day. I didn't know what to do. I really put my mind into learning English and being the best student I could be in doing art. My biggest thing was to make something for my Christmas present for my parents every single year. In Poland, they cut out paper and they fold it up, paste other colors onto it, and they could be amazing, beautiful. And my mother had some and I thought, I'm going to make one of those, but I'm, mine's going to be the best you've ever seen. I spent an entire year and I made this crazy thing that was embellished with all kinds of colors and cut them out, pasted it onto it. And my parents still have it, it's hanging on the wall. So I occupied myself with art and it saved me. I'm telling you, I, I drew and painted and I would do my homework and then I would do that every single day. It's kind of been a lifesaver for me my entire life. I've never stopped. I started when I was three and it's been in my life, no matter what. And then fast forward to now you're heading off to university. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what choices did you make there? And, and, and then ultimately how is that affecting your art today? My parents grew me to be a scientist. So I decided to be a chemistry major with a biochemistry track. They felt I couldn't make any money with being an artist. I actually wanted to be an architect because I thought, well, I can put my art into play and I was really good with spatial, three-dimensional thought and art and I could combine that, but they said, well, you can't make money as an architect. I went into that and I did a little bit of research in biochemistry and chemistry. I wrote a paper with one of my professors. I was gonna cure malaria. <laughs> And I, but I wanted to see how it would be to be a researcher because I had worked with my parents in, in the lab my mm -hmm. entire life since I came. I took photographs, I developed their photographs in their dark room, 
So I learned how to become a photographer and that is still one of my passions. But I didn't like the idea of just spending time in the lab by myself. You know, I'm a social person and I thought, man, I don't really think I can do that. I decided that was not the path for me. I wanted to be social and be with people. I wanted to do some good for people, be mm -hmm. of use. And so I applied to medical school mm -hmm. uh, a couple times and I was pre-med, pre-dent, and I didn't get in. Mm -hmm. I, did, I didn't get in twice. I applied to all kinds of major medical schools in the country and I'll never forget, I was in Chicago. I won't name the school, but I went in and this younger guy was interviewing me and he goes, well, this is a very expensive private school. How are you going to pay for it? And I said, well, I'm going to get a loan. <laughs> and he said, well, I have a better idea uh, for you. There's a Playboy club right across the street. You could work there and make more money. As a woman at the time and being attractive, I don't think that really helped me a whole lot. Mm. So I decided to apply to dental school too. Went into my dentist's office and told him that I was thinking about it. So he let me watch him mm -hmm. to see if that's something be for me. And I'm thinking, wow, I don't like amalgam, the silver, the gold that people put in their mouth, but maybe something will come out that's better than that. Because at that time there was no composite material, tooth colored. So I thought, well, maybe I'd be an orthodontist. That's something beautifying somebody. I'm mm -hmm. always about prettiness and beauty around you and creating art. I did get to dental school immediately and I liked it okay, but I didn't like the fact we didn't wear gloves at the time and what we did was hurting people. I really had a hard time with that, even though you were doing good things. Going back in Poland, I had some dental experiences as a child where you go to the office, there was no anesthetic and you mm. were put in like a barber chair. And it mm -hmm. took one or two appointments to have a filling done because it was excruciating. You can imagine my mother would hold my hand and I would scream and cry. And this is baby mm -hmm. teeth, obviously. And I remember how horrific it was. I thought maybe I can make up for that and be the kindest, most gentle dentist they've ever had. Maybe they won't go through anything like it, what I've gone through. I still have that fear of dentists, believe it or not, too. Even though I went to work every day. I went to dental school at Oregon in Portland, OHSU. Mm -hmm. And I met my first husband at school. He had already signed up with the Navy. Mm. To be with him, I went in as a direct commission officer. We ended up in San Diego. You guys were together then? No, they don't put married people together in the military. Well, I mean you were in the same base and stuff? Okay. No, no. No, okay. No, there were many Navy bases. I was at MCRD, Marine Corps Recruit Depot. Okay. Marines don't have medical or dental and they borrow from the Navy. Uh, okay. And yeah, so I was stationed right by the airport in San Diego. That's where MCRD is. And my husband, Bob, he was stationed at NTC Naval Training Center, mm -hmm. which is a Navy dental clinic. I was very fortunate in that, first of all, Marines were role gentlemen, and I was in a clinic with 35 other dentists, get a practice going. And how long um, did you do that for? I've done dentistry for 34 years. What? And, yes. <laughs> 34 years. 34 years. Gone through a lot, set up a, bunch of, you know, a couple of practices, sold them, learned a lot about business had a divorce, went through another marriage, each one 15 years, oh, wow. two children, all kinds of things that it was really hard to keep my art going. My sister passed away from colon cancer and mm. that's what I think started me going, wow, I need to be doing my art, husband and children. And when she was diagnosed. She lived for three years with the medications and everything, but she was only 40. Yeah, and her son, when she passed away, the youngest one is only 11. I would visit her once a month in her last six months of her life and have these little tiles on her desk there. And she was really sick and going through chemo and all kinds of things, but she would still paint. And I'm thinking, wow, 
that's incredible. And I was at awe you know, that she continued doing her art. When she passed away, my two daughters and I flew over there and we went to her memorial. I'll never forget, there were so many people who loved her as a math mathematician, but as a person, an artist, her art was everywhere hmm. displayed and I can't let this go. This is my passion. And if she did it under those circumstances, I, there's no excuse for me. I have to start. I just started again and it's been a long time, 11, 12 years. And oh, wow. I started doing flowers, I did oil, I did every single medium. I didn't really try to sell it. I just tried to get familiar with doing art again, but also seeing what it is that I'm searching for in art. Painting? Is it sculpture? How does that feel? It wasn't something I chose not to do. Something happened in the practice I was working with. <laughs> yeah, I didn't choose that. I don't think I would have ever been able to quit because it was a passion. And mm. my patients were my friends and I was really good at it. Yeah, that was like a new beginning for me. It was a heartbreak, really. I was left without. It's been my saving grace. And every time something happened to me, my relationships failing, my life changing. There's so many good painters, so many good everything. What is there that I can do with art that is so difficult? Most people won't even touch it, right? <laughs> so I like I just, that attitude about you. I don't know. It's, I'm just uh, like, I don't know what that is. But so I found scratch board somehow online and I was looking and I go, oh my God, this is the most amazing thing. And I picked it up and I did it in that little gallery and people were just in awe of the whole idea and it wasn't very good. And so when Marty approached me, I said, no, oh, I have like five, six pieces. They're not very good. I'm just beginning. And he said, well, let me see. And so he looked at it on my phone and he goes, you're really talented, you're really good. I wanna see the originals to see what they're like. And I go, I got kind of embarrassed about it. But I did bring them over there and, and he goes, you have so much opportunity here to grow your art. I'm not gonna tell you what to do, what subjects to do, just let it fly. I'll just let you get better. I'll put these out for sale and you're just gonna go. He just so, so he's become on, a mentor. So there's a very, 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 very key thing he said in there, which most, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot of artists don't hear. And he looked at your work. And if he would have said, wow, there's a lot of potential here, that would have been like a kiss of death, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he said there's a lot of opportunity. And that little shift is so, so different. It was. He said one thing to me that I'll never forget, and I use it a lot, actually. And he said, you know what the difference between someone doing art and someone who is a true artist? And I said, what is it? He goes, because true artists have to do art just to live. Mm -hmm. It's just this drive in them. They have to do it. And I thought, that's me. I've I've had this emptiness in me when I'm not doing art and it's, it was probably only 10 years that I didn't do it but the 10 years was I was so essential in my soul and and I treasure him because he's become a great friend and my mentor because of him I felt acknowledged that I'm worthy of pursuing it and doing it and mm -hmm. something doesn't work out try something else so he's allowed me to try different types of art and different things and put them on the wall and they sold but you know some were more successful than others and I talked to him often I'm one lucky girl I decided that galleries aren't the only outlet communication through internet through all the different platforms that are available I thought I'm going to overcome my shyness in that I'm good one-on-one -on -one. talking to you is good Public speaking is really, really hard for me. And it's really hard for me to get out there and not feel intimidated. And I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go for it. It's the hardest thing I've ever done. I'm just gonna do the social media thing, Instagram, mm -hmm. Facebook, and I'm gonna do a YouTube channel on my art. And oh my goodness, 
I had no idea what I was getting into there. The other thing I also did after dentistry went away, I thought I need to use my left and right brain. I need to be learning so mm -hmm. much. And I love three-dimensional art. And I thought I'm going to come up with something nobody's ever done before. So I learned a CAD CAM program, 3D. And I thought if I make these contemporary designs on a CAD CAM, then I'm going to have to find someone who will cut them for me and I can embellish them somehow. And I had no clue what I was doing. I ended up making designs that were really cool. I ended up talking to Steve Shank and he does cabinets and he cuts with a CNC machine. It's a machine that uses software to cut perfectly, whatever the software tells him. I talked to him, he goes, I'm really interested in art and doing really different things than just cabinetry. He's done it for a long time. He's really good at it. We became a team and he started cutting my designs out, nice. out of wood and different multimedia material and putting it together. I didn't know how I was going to embellish them. It kind of big and I always go too big. Then I have to go small with art. Mm -hmm. And so I was in the garage finishing up one of the pieces and my neighbor, who's an artist, came over. She goes, how are you going to finish this up? She goes, resin. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I had no idea what, about resin. I knew nothing about it. And I said, have you done it? And she goes, oh no, but I know you. You'll learn and you'll teach me. <laughs> so I started resin and all the things that are amazing in resin. Mm -hmm. I just fell in love with resin. And so then I started embellishing them with resin, what I learned, and I made a lot of mistakes. I did all kinds of things, but that's how resin came to life. And that's only been, I don't know, seven months, maybe. I oh, feel wow. like I've done it my whole life. Hmm. I'm doing the scratch board and I'm doing the resin. I love to do multimedia. And then I started learning about, okay, so if you're going to get out there, YouTube is probably a good thing because it's visual and you can send the message to people, I'm here and here's my art and do it for the love of art. Teach people how to make things. Everybody's always asking me, how did you do that? You know, show me how. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, I'll do that. So then I had to learn how to video, how to do the different things I've never done before as far as video. So that's been really difficult. It's all consuming. And the are you videos doing that all by yourself? Art. I hired a uh, photographer that also is very passionate about what I'm doing. And he's been helping me set up the studio for the video. I spent a lot of money and effort and energy into doing it the best I can be because I never go halfway on anything. The, the quality of it is, is top notch. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah, from, and you know, he's really helped. Editing is another situation. I had, mm -hmm. you know, I had no idea how difficult it was going to be and we're using three cameras and being a tiny little drop of water and falling in this huge ocean and the drop falling to the very bottom and nobody's going to know you're down there until you float to the surface and you have to persevere and be persistent yep. and it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever done. If you use the analogy of being a drop of water mm -hmm. falling into the ocean mm -hmm. you have to figure out how can you not be a drop of water, but be a drop of blood? Mm. Because if you're a drop of blood that falls, a red drop of blood that falls into a blue ocean, mm -hmm. sharks will smell that miles away. And they'll, <laughs> right? You know, that's good. Yeah, you're, you're right. So you, you go in with a new idea. You're like blood and water, sharks come, and then they... And then there's a feeding frenzy. And then once somebody sees that, then they want to jump in and then everyone's doing it. And so right, part of right, being in right. business is always trying to find new water that you can be blood in, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, um, yeah, heard, you know, yeah so, that's really yeah. great. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I don't know if I like to be a blood a drop, drop blood. but maybe that's what I <laughs> am. <laughs> Sometimes it's like you have to kind of get very creative in the environments that you go into. And yes, then, I agree. You know, so that you stand out from everyone else. Well, I think it's kind of like an exponential curve. First mm -hmm. you start small and it's really hard to get going. It's so yeah. hard. You get one person every week that you post a video just to subscribe. Yeah. 
people don't really understand how a search engine works, what that's all about. They think mm -hmm. watching is enough, but it's not. All those kind of things. Yep. And once you get to a certain level, I think it exponentially will explode and you either disseminate the blood drop or <laughs> that's when the sharks come. <laughs> when you start a business, you don't want to just keep producing all kinds of things for all kinds of people and then you're just kind of making small sales. But how do you create like a big business, you know, on one thing? And yeah, yeah. yeah. And because you're very, very focused, you know, on the resin. One of the things you want to do is build partnerships or connections with the same people who serve the same people that you would be serving. Right. Yes. And I agree. I, yeah, I totally, totally agree with that. You know, one thing I've done a lot of research, obviously, before I started the YouTube, because it's who I am. I don't mm -hmm. want to be going out there blind and everybody says your first video is your worst video. Well, it is <laughs> as far as me, because I'm pretty stiff in it. I'm pretty stiff in the first three, but you're getting better. Everybody says you have to start with a really narrow niche. Then once you get a bunch of followers, then you can branch out and do the other things that you really wanted to do to begin with, but you really can't without a following. So I thought, how can I do a YouTube on scratch board art? You can't. It's like scratch, scratch, scratch. It's really amazing what happens at the end, but I can't be doing That's that. Correct. And when I, yeah. So when I discovered resin, I thought, wow, it, the world is totally open to so many different things you can do with resin. You can incorporate scratch board art into with resin. And I am going to be doing that. I made these really beautiful frames for my scratch board art they're perfect you know they fit in perfectly and i'm gonna combine them with resin i'm gonna do resin art around my scratch board art on these frames and they all become the whole thing becomes a piece of art and i'm gonna do that on youtube i'm trying to be smart about it and not saturate people with things they can't really do themselves because they'll go well that's nice but i can't do this at home so i thought well i'll just start with simple simpler things that anyone can buy some resin kind of tolerance and learn how to do pieces of art that really aren't that hard i mean you do have to practice but anyone who wants to do that kind of thing they can and then over time <clears throat> as i get more out there the sharks might come i know we talked about this last time um but if you're creating a youtube channel to teach people how to do resin mm -hmm. and let's say you get a following you know a couple thousand people and 40% of them are resin artists or wanting to be that. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't really thought about it until this moment, but I wonder if you could somehow become a promoter of them, you know, like you, you create a website where you sell that stuff on, but you have, you, you basically start gathering resin artists that then you're promoting along with your work, of, of course. Oh uh, yeah. Well, things are going to happen along the way that you don't predict. You have no idea who's going to see your YouTube channel is going to see you just like how we met on Facebook. I had no idea what was going to happen when I started posting my art on Facebook. I, I admire people like you for that <laughs> because everything you just said there scares the total crap out of me. I'm like so analytical and need to know where every line happens in my art, why it's there, where it starts, where it ends. Like, thought through and overly thought through and overly planned. I know that about myself. Uh -huh. And so I always love people who are totally not like that. Well, I used to be a lot more like that. It's my scientific side, always planned, always was ready. And I'm still a planner, but I realized art is not that way. Art is free. You just have to go with it. I'm not planning on making a bunch of money on it. I'm not planning to make any money on it. If, if it's a side product, great. If not, I just want to have people see the art, appreciate it. Who knows what's, who's going to see me? Gosh, you know, wouldn't that be amazing if it was famous? But my goodness, that would be being a drop in the ocean and going to the bottom <laughs> to try to get that. So I'm realistic in that way always a journey you know, to Absolutely. anything that even you plan is the yeah. most exciting part because once you get there you wonder if that was it
right? Yeah. So I have a really good analogy for you. I don't know where I heard it. Some guy that was really famous and really wealthy man, he said, I worked so hard in my life. I was like in a rainforest in this jungle and I was cutting the branches and I was moving and I was working and I was sweating and it was so hard and it was the hardest thing I've ever done and I could not wait to get out of the jungle. So my whole goal was get out of the jungle and be free to do what I want to do. And it would take him years to get through the jungle and he knew it. Finally, he saw the light come out of the jungle like there's a clearing here. I think this is it. So he came out into the meadow and he smelled the flowers and he stayed on the beach and he goes, wow, I think I really miss the jungle. <laughs> I think I'm going to go back in. <laughs> and that's exactly how I feel. Yeah. That's how creative yeah. spirit is you. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's like when know. business people talk about it, they kind of chuckle. They want to be businessman say man all I'm going to do is make a million dollars and then go sit on the beach and no. just retire early and they're like <laughs> retire what are you talking about you know and so I've heard it from so many wealthy people where they they quote made it and then they went to retire early and they're like okay the first two weeks in uh, Tahiti drinking martinis or whatever is really nice and then it's just like I gotta go start another business or I gotta go chase something or hunt something or you exactly. know exactly yeah. I think I think happiness make something, yeah. is having a purpose yeah I think, I think everybody needs a purpose it's very fortunate if they have a passion but if they don't have a passion they need a purpose to get up in the morning and do something they enjoy at least or mm -hmm. love for me as an artist I've always had both of those things I was very fortunate. Dentistry became a passion. Beautification of people, cosmetic dentistry, that's what I did, and that was my art. So I have an eye for that, and I was known for that, mm -hmm. and I still am. People still calling me, when are you going to come back? It's like, I don't really want to. I'm really doing <laughs> something else that I'm just loving. Space in my soul is very Well, it's is nice that you know cool. it's there if you need it or if you it want is. it. It is. I have but... to be my license. I'm just so passionate about what I'm doing right now. And um, how would you define purpose? When I talk about my art or talk about creating or anything mm -hmm. like that and having that in, in me, inside me, mm -hmm. it just makes me so happy and excited. And my mind just goes in so many different places at the same time. It almost sounds like the first part of a purpose is you have to become self-aware of what's going on inside you. Yes, I think so. Okay. Um, because then you're just running after what, what other people are telling you to do and it's not coming out of you. It's not something that's the, or started with inside of you. Uh -huh. If you see it there and then you're running after it, what does the running after it mean? Like how, how, how do we illustrate that? I don't know. It's just a natural thing that happens. You have a purpose and you have a passion for it it just you have to do it for your life i mean you just have to do it it's not it's like a drive you can't help it it's just like a little motor inside of you it goes go at the time that you have you're putting your effort your energy your thoughts your money everything into seeing that thing manifest it like that that thing that's inside you yes so you and believing you're leaving in yourself that you will be successful yeah. now success does not mm. mean money to mm -hmm. me, success means that people to appreciate art, to understand, oh, maybe me and maybe a little selfish me saying, I love your art. Thank you for sharing. But just a passion for art and having it as an important part of people's lives, disseminating, I think mm -hmm. life would be very bland without that creativity around us and people take it for granted. Art in itself doesn't mean anything unless somebody looks at it feels something mm -hmm. talks to you all those things and i want to spread that word that it is important it's important to educate people about it it's important to have it in your life it's kind of like having air to mm -hmm. breathe you know it's, it's it's beautiful um in my my new home i'm acquiring artwork uh, of a standard that I'm very, very happy with. 
and furniture and, and artwork. And I remember getting up very early in the morning and it was dark and, and you know, there was a little bit of light from the computer and this and that. And, and I just remember like walking from one room to the other and realizing that my walls were not flat anymore. It was a mm-hmm. texture to the walls because of the frames, because of the books that were on the table, because of the shapes of the chairs that I had, you know. And I was like, ooh. And the texture that was formed in the space, I was like, ooh, yeah, that's I, a good I, point. I like this, you know? You know? That's a really good point, yeah. <clears throat> and, and and so, yeah, it, 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 there there is something about having art and, and it, it, you know, becoming it's like another a spice. dimension yeah. yeah it gives you a dimension that doesn't exist in the flatness yeah i totally agree i i just moved a year ago into a new townhouse that is very contemporary and i've been kind of stuck with a non-contemporary type of art and so now i just i love it and well, i used to think contemporary art just is flat art anyone can do it <laughs> <laughs> i really did and I kind of look down on it. I go to museums and things. I go, ooh, what's that? Now I have a huge appreciation for it because it's not easy. The composition and the way that the light falls on it, whether it's got texture or not, that kind of thing. So there's a, a definite art to making that kind of art. And in a way, that's how resin art is presenting itself. I've been very tight with my art and very detailed and this permits me to extend my, because resin is unpredictable. You don't know what you're going to get. And, I was going to say uh, that. It, you know? where, where your scratch board, you're very much in control. Yes. <laughs> Every line, you're in control. But resin, it, it almost seems like you have to give it its space to do what it's going to do, and then you catch it. Um, yes, yes, exactly. And you know what's interesting about resin, too? If you play with it too long, you're going to mm-hmm. ruin it. Mm. So exciting to watch. I've learned just to let it go. And I used to, my first learning, I just, it was never quite right when it was happening. It wasn't as good as if I just left it alone. And now with the video, I just thought I've had that patience. Patience for it just to develop and do not play. It's hard to stop. And so that should be a video you do, right? On the patience that's required. And yeah. you talk about how you can ruin it. And then right at the right moment, you you know, the, the, the camera flashes and you're like in Elsa's dress, you know, from Frozen. <laughs> and you're like, you got to let it go. <laughs> let it go. But, I, I, well, I could. <laughs> no, so, so that's why I thought I would present a piece that I made just for this podcast. Mm-hmm. Well, people can watch me make this piece and listen, but... I had to have a lot of patience for that one because I just let these cells develop and I've learned just to stop. And that's kind of what this was about. Art is patience too. Life is patience. Trying to get out there in social media is patience. It's doing dentistry required a ton of patience. Patience, and I don't mean patient. (laughs) I was thinking that. I was like, yeah, it's a practice, and you need patience. Yeah, you know, enough to get a really great rapport and communication between you and the patient required a lot because a lot of times I'm out of time. Dentistry is, oh my gosh, time would fly by like no other. There was never enough time. Mm -hmm. But to me, I would actually schedule... 15 20 minutes extra at least for talking because that's how we got the patient no. comfortable that was more <laughs> important than the dentistry the dentistry was easy it was mm. you know, the making Don't people comfortable and yes yeah, so i feel like art in a way is that way too like resin and that kind of thing well, i have to say i have to really appreciate you for a moment on that philosophy um because i remember when when um my daughter was you know being made uh and we'd have to go to the to the doctors for the checkups and stuff and and during that time i became very uh conscious of the um the healthcare business mm-hmm. you know it's like hey before you can even talk to us you have to pay us this and sign this and then you can say hello mm-hmm. um and you know it was just kind of like in out in out 
Um, yes. It was very transactional, right? But to take the time to actually schedule relational time and making making that relationship work um, is, I think, very very beautiful, and um, and it and it's and it's brilliant. It's funny because my friend, this person, and I, we would just call it talk time. <laughs> not just for the patients I did it for me mm -hmm. because I love my patients and it made me feel like they're going to trust me more and I want to know more about their fears their everything they would I would be like a psychologist to them they could trust me and I just felt honored to be in that role and that's why I think for that was because of the people it wasn't the dentistry itself yes I did beautiful dentistry and I created pretty huge significant changes in people's smiles mm -hmm. and change their lives I mean <clears throat> it would change their lives but aside from that it's the people that I just loved I still miss that that's the art part of art that being alone and lonely and you don't feel the loneliness while you're creating because obviously you're in that zone and you're creating but when you're trying to do other things and you're still alone. I miss that part. So the social media, it's not the same as one-on-one -on -one kind of mm -hmm. situation, but it definitely takes the edge of the uh, being alone with yeah. social media. People are talking to you, they're texting you, all kinds of things. And for most part, they're all good. They're very positive and supportive and all those things. And so I feel like that's really, a huge plus mm -hmm. um, not the same yeah, I, 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 I feel you because it's hard because as artists we're often isolated yes and um, that's why the quarantine is kind of it's not funny but it kind of is to artists and designers because oh we have to be locked inside oh no you know I like, know okay. right unless there's someone like you who's like naturally social right mm -hmm. um, and then, and then I get a little concerned for you guys because then you're like bouncing off the walls. I need people. <laughs> well, um, I'm not bouncing off the walls. I like to be not yet. You know, obviously, being creative. I, I like to be alone too. But yeah. This this time we're actually launching this week. Um, I bought a website called drinkanddraw.live, mm -hmm. and uh, we're gonna do these uh, online art parties, kind of like you know your wine and sip thing. Uh, oh, okay. Wine and paint or whatever, but but in these cases, we're actually going to draw together and, and compose out a little simple picture over three days, and um, uh, but the whole idea is you know we go online and you plug in and and now we're like with, other with a whole bunch of people, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And you, you could grab a you know you grab a beer or a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or something, and so we're going to make it into a game, a fun experience. <laughs> um, but this idea, you know. Um, because of this coronavirus and everything it's just forcing people to really reevaluate re the importance of connecting you know um no i totally agree and i think everything happens for a reason there's a silver lining at the end of the rainbow it just makes people kind of think about what's important in life yep. and yep. their families people they care about loved ones it's important in your own life like what do you want out of that and because only in solitude and quiet you can really think mm -hmm. and it may not come to you right off but I think something good comes out of every negative difficult situation and uh, people are going to go back to basics hopefully talk to, on the phone communicate yeah. better and all those things that we are missing in the computer era the social media kind of thing is good but it's not how it used to be and it used to be better <laughs> so let me ask you this this question and then i'm going to ask you how people can get in contact with you what do you like to cook or you know oh well i think we talked about i am not a cook i like to be treated <laughs> as a princess i like to be taken out to a really nice restaurant and i treat myself to biscotti in the morning i do have my princess morning and coffee I can wow. make that myself. I know I'm really spoiled that way. I never grew up with cooks in mm -hmm. the house and I don't like it. It's a waste of time. I could take a pill. Honestly, I'd rather be doing, <laughs> I'd rather be doing art and just being busy with what I want to do. I don't 
food is just such a distraction. Except great company, all that. So that I do enjoy. So food is a way of gathering people together, but the food itself, you're just like, eh, I'll just yeah, exactly. I'll just live off exactly. this this water drop. I actually like to eat fish. I don't eat red mm. meat, but that's not good for me. I used to live on cheese. I was cheese holic because the cooking part is just a pain. Except it's who you're with that matters, and mm-hmm. food has never been a big deal to me. Well, this will yeah. be a very unique podcast going down in history. <laughs> I might know, have been right? like one, maybe there might have been one other person who's like, yeah, food. <laughs> I always had trouble eating. I had, hadn't had a bed until I was in dental school. Parents, um, I slept on a couch that mm. kind of op- the back opened up, and that's where you put the sheets and everything. And then mm-hmm. it became like a couch, and that was in my room. Hard as a rock, they still have it, and I cannot believe I slept on that thing. It's like a board. But that's what I use as a desk. So I would sit on the floor. And I would do my art. I would do my homework on it, and I would lock the door so people wouldn't disturb me because I want to be focused. I want to be straight A's, but also was very focused on my art. And I would do my art. It would be gifts for my parents for Christmas. I didn't want them to see it, so it was mm-hmm. a secret. So my mother would knock at the door and say, "Well, dinner's ready." I, I'm telling you, I think she had to do it three times before I get up. I'm coming. I'm coming, and I wouldn't come because I was so into. Yeah. what I was doing and I still feel the same way like it's seven o'clock or eight and I haven't even eaten anything all day it's like what is wrong with you you can't even think you're hypoglycemic you should have eaten something <laughs> so into what I do that I forget the world food's one of them <laughs> that's cool I dig it I dig it Marietta, that was a beautiful conversation well thank you it was very fun I really enjoyed it brought How back can- some memories <laughs> how can uh, people reach out to you or find you we have a website it's mariettasart.com hmm. and I did put my last name in there because it's hard to find it's buyer b-a-j-e-r Facebook you look me out on YouTube under my name Marietta Buyer I did use my name I can't be found just by looking at resin right now I'm in the body of the ocean one way or another the blood hasn't like spread yet <laughs> <laughs> just look me up on Google my name's all over the place if you ever need to update your name maybe you just need to be like Marietta blood resin I know blood oh, resin, blood resin. what's that like <laughs> right you, 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 it's just to get people there. Blood resin. Oh my Ooh, god, blood like. resin. Ew. <laughs> <laughs> oh my I goodness. Look at my website, marietasart.com, to find out whether any of my art pieces talks to you. Sign up for my email list to receive notice of promotions and new artwork for sale. Feel free to contact me with questions through my website. In order for me to continue, making video tutorials on YouTube to keep you entertained, inspired,